So today we're continuing our series on things you can get wrong reading the Bible. And we're talking about this passage from Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 9, and uh, I've simply referred to plucking out the eye. I have to say this is one of those passages that I thought you couldn't get wrong. Um, but a few weeks ago I was on Reddit and uh, watching the conversations taking place there. It was very clear that someone had indeed uh, taken this story very, very literally. So we read it in Mark's Gospel here in chapter 9. Uh, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. And then it's repeated, of course, twice, almost exactly the same, uh, hand first and then foot and then finally the eye. And we find the same teaching occurring in Matthew's Gospel also in a shorter form, but it's interesting, Matthew actually uses it twice. It appears in uh, chapter 5, which is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and it also appears in uh, chapter 18. And if we look at this on the surface, if life in the spiritual world is eternal, and if hell is real, then on the face of it this seems like quite sensible advice. Yet it's interesting to note that I know of no Christian group anywhere that takes this literally. Well, why not? If it is such sensible advice, why do we not take this passage literally? Well, speaking literally, Jesus' teachings is, are known for a couple of quite significant um, characteristics. For one thing, Jesus is known for his use of hyperbole. He exaggerates to make his point. And for another thing, he's known to contradict his audience's expectations. So, for example, an exaggeration. Peter questions him about forgiveness and says, Lord, should I forgive seven times? And Jesus' response to it, you will know, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. It's an exaggeration, naturally speaking. A contradiction of his listeners' expectations. Well, that would be the parable of the Good Samaritan, as an example. You see, for, for Jesus' contemporaries, those two words, Good and Samaritan, did not belong together. Uh, it was uh, quite a shocking idea to the listener of, listeners of his time. So these are both rhetorical devices that he's using to make a point. He's using it so that his audience sit up and take notice of what he's saying. Unfortunately for us, after a few thousand years of being familiar with these passages, the effect of that is dulled somewhat on our perception of things. Look, I want to dwell for a moment on this um, contradiction of expectations. You see, in Jesus' time and in the, the mind of the Jews who would have heard him preach, there is an obsession with physical perfection. And in many ways, we see the same thing in our own society today. And we, re we see that reflected in Old Testament law. So we heard Julian reading this morning from Leviticus chapter 21, the requirements of the priestly office. And I want to draw your attention to it, and particularly um, the law regarding deformity. So it says here, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. For any man who has a defect shall not approach a man, a man blind or lame who has a marred face or any limb too long, a man who has a broken foot or broken hand or is a hunchback or a dwarf or a man who has a defect in his eye or eczema or scab or is a eunuch. 
And I particularly want you to note the reference to blind or lame and the broken foot or broken hand. You see, such deformities in, uh, in the Jewish religion disqualified you from serving the Lord in any way. So, if we were to apply this passage literally, I have to tell you, I would be disqualified from service as a minister by virtue of my increasing baldness, the fact that I trim my beard, and the fact that I'm short-sighted, I must wear glasses. But I want you also to notice what is not mentioned in this passage. What is missing from these requirements of the priest and the high priest? There's no mention of wisdom or intelligence. There's no mention of caring for a community or members of the community. There's not even any mention of love towards the Lord. And they seem strange omissions, don't they, when we're talking about the role of a priest. Now, there are many other passages in the Old Testament which talk about the need for perfection, and I'll draw your attention particularly to the perfection of sacrifice. So we have, for example, the Passover lamb must be a lamb without defect, and that is uh, repeated many times through the Old Testament law. So why is this written into scripture in this way? It's very easy for us to believe that the role of the priest is to offer our sacrifice and our, um, our supplications to God, to kind of present our will before the Lord and to appease him and kind of curry favor with the Lord so that we can get what we want, get the w things the way we want them to be. And having that view, it's easy then to think, well, that's why the high priest must be perfect, because he must represent our needs uh, before the Lord. And if he's not perfect, then um, that uh, petition is somehow marred or disadvantaged. That is not the reality. The reality of the high priest's role is not to present our wishes to the Lord, but to represent the Lord's work in our lives. Now, why can I say that? Well, I say that because both the Apostle Paul and the teachings of, a, of the new church point to this that the high priest represents the Lord. Uh, Paul talks about it in um, the book of Hebrews. The, the high priest is a type of the Lord. The, the high priest shows us what the Lord accomplished in his life on earth. And the same is true of the sacrifice also, that the sacrifice was a type of the Lord. The sacrifice reflects for us the Lord's work in this world and the Lord's work in our lives. And to a pe people and a culture who are obsessed with perfection, the only way for the Lord's work to be reflected in their lives is through physical perfection. And this is why you don't have our requirements of wisdom and intelligence or caring for people or love for the Lord in this office of the high priest. And so the Jews of Jesus' day looked down on deformity and disability. In many cases, these people would be cast out of their homes, they would be cast out of their communities, they would be unable to make a living, and they would be reduced to begging on the streets in order to survive. So when Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to hell. He challenges the belief that physical perfection is required to serve the Lord. Now bear in mind what those words follow. 
they follow this. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. You see, physical perfection, far from qualifying you for service, would be a significant spiritual disadvantage if you were to use it to commit evil as a result. In such a case, you would be better off without it. So then I want to go back to my original question. Why don't we take this literally? Well, we have to ask, would losing a hand or losing a foot or losing an eye prevent you from committing evil? When Jesus uses these words in Matthew's Gospel in the Sermon on the Mount, this is what he's talking about. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And he goes on to say, you know, if the eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. But of course, it doesn't require an eye, does it, to commit this sin, to commit this error. So he's pointing to something deeper, and that is obvious and clear to almost every Christian who reads this passage. So when we talk about the hand, we're talking about our power. And it doesn't need to be a physical hand, it is our power in life. It might be our authority over others. You see, it isn't the hand itself that is the problem, it's the way that we use it. The hand can be a force for evil, for sure, but it can also be a force for great good. Power and authority in themselves are not bad. It is the manner in which they are used that matters so much. So it's the purpose behind the use of power or use of status. Is it for the welfare of others? Or is it for my own status? Is it for the respect in which I hope to be regarded? Or is it simply that I might get my own way in life? Is it my fascination with the power and authority in itself that causes me to act? If that were the case, I would be better off without that power. I would be better off without that authority. The foot represents natural life, just as the foundation of a house represents our natural life and our natural actions. It's the actions I take, it's the journeys I travel. It's the manifestation of the desires that are within my heart. Now, if we are to obsess with physical perfection of the hand and the foot and the eye, if we're to focus on the worldly and bodily interests of the natural life, then this really is where, where our consciousness is. It's within our natural life. And we would actually be better off not focusing on these things. So if I have that obsession with physical perfection, and that causes me to sin, I'm better off without it. And the I is the understanding. Now the understanding, as we know from the teachings of the Church, is ruled by the will. And the understanding becomes the means by which the will achieves its desires. But the understanding can also be the means by which we look back at the will and discover its true nature. The understanding can be the means to achieve those desires or to challenge them. To get what I want or to challenge myself and to grow. I don't know whether you remember, but the passage that we read from uh, Psalm 119 to begin the service today, 
Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. You see, without an understanding, without the eye to see the law, where are we? But if our eye were to cause us to sin, we are in a better condition to have it plucked out. You see, evil and falsity, its effect on our lives is to close down the Lord's influence in our lives. And we are actually in a better condition, not having understanding, than to use an understanding of the teachings of the church to commit what is evil. Because we have then not had the opportunity to close that influence down in the same way. So it's better to be without understanding, it's better to be without power. It's better to turn our back on bodily and worldly interests than to use any of them consciously and knowingly to commit evil. Knowledge and ability carry responsibility. And then the last part of that reading from Mark I don't know whether you remember, the Lord said, for everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. And I just want to make the connection here with the fire that is being spoken of in this verse with the fire of hell, which was spoken of in, in the previous verses. So everyone will be seasoned with fire. We will all run into this experience, but the question is, do I reject it or confirm it in my life? That fire are the evil desires. These are the thoughts that pop into our mind from time to time. We all have those thoughts. We're not responsible for them, but they provide us with a choice. Do I follow that line of thinking or do I challenge it? So we shouldn't ever expect ourselves never to have evil thoughts. That would be ridiculous. Thoughts come and go. They flow in without our bidding. But the question is, do I entertain those thoughts? You see, these parts of our life, our power, our natural life, our understanding, these are the arenas in which sin takes place but they're also the arenas in which we discover that it is a sin. And they can become the catalyst whereby we begin, with the Lord's help, to take some remedial action against them. And the Lord can use these areas of our life to help us to grow and to become better people. So I want to say that Jesus' words are um, a challenge to the mindset that focuses purely on bodily and worldly interests, that physical perfection. The hand, the foot and the eye represent spiritual faculties and these are often where the real problems of our life occur. But these faculties can look heavenward and they can look towards hell and it is our choice. So the thing that I really want you to remember today is that knowledge and ability carry responsibility. There are several examples I might share with you. Uh, one is finances. One of the great problems of our natural world, I think, is the credit card. Because the credit card gives everybody a measure of financial freedom, allegedly, which may not be appropriate. They give us access to financial resources that are not our own and they take a great deal of care and responsibility to use correctly and safely. And it would be a quite reasonable course of action if you believe that you don't have the self-control of possessing a credit card, simply not to have a credit card. 
You see, that is a taking away of an ability in order to make a real positive choice in your life. It becomes a point of self-control. In the arena of diet and exercise, you know, I can tell you I was never very fond of exercising and for me, the way to make an exercise part of my life was to make it my daily commute to work. It was the way that I got to work and therefore I had no choice. I just had to get on my bicycle and I had to ride. And that for me was the best way to exercise um, that choice and that self-control and that motivation. So I was taking away an ability to use the car. And I also want to reflect on theology also. The new church believes that far from needing to be a Christian to access heaven, that every person who lives on this planet has opportunity to go to heaven. What Christianity does is give us a knowledge and a responsibility. And many times Swedenborg in his writings describes the, the great depths that people fall into when they fail to practice the religion, the Christianity that they say they believe in. And he compares that with the lot of Gentiles who have no knowledge of the Lord and because they have not had that knowledge, they've not had the opportunity to close that influence down in the same way. And so when they go into the spiritual world and they're awakened, they have opportunity to learn the truth and they have opportunity to access heaven. They may not have opportunity to grow in the same extent, but they have not had the opportunity to confirm the depths of those evils that um, sometimes get confirmed in the lives of some Christians because they have known the word. We're only held accountable for the knowledge and the abilities that we possess. And so knowledge and ability carries with it responsibility. So I'm going to ask you this week to reflect what are the responsibilities that your knowledge and abilities place on you.